All, All right. right, we're live with RB with Rebecca Varuch. This is one of my longest standing friends. She married my best friend in which uh, I was able to be the best man just a few years ago and about 60 pounds ago for me. <laughs> and uh, she has a number of interests, I think that cross over with me, but chief amongst these is that the title of this podcast is the philosophy of art and science. And Rebecca happens to be one of the only other people I know who's taken a course in university studies called the philosophy of art. So why don't we start with how are you and how did you get into the philosophy of art? Oh, I'm good. Um, so when I was in high school, I went to um, a humanities magnet high school. So I had the opportunity to study some really amazing stuff that I feel like a lot of people don't get to study, you know, before college age. So when I was 15, 16 years old, we were studying, you know, Hume and Descartes and, you know, really like diving into these philosophical thinkers that, you know, were way above my mental pay grade um, at the time for sure. But it, that, that that level of exposure really kind of piqued my interest because I always was was a person who um, wanted to know why mm. you know things were the way they were. The, there's a funny story that my mom tells about my bat mitzvah um, and how I argued with the rabbi who Rabbi Shulweis. He was this like really like big macher to use the the Yiddish term, like very um, prestigious um, reconstructionist rabbi um, at Valley Beth Shalom. And he was this kind of like old, very learned man. And um, there he he said, okay, uh, I, I do you have any questions for, for me? And I said, I have tons, you know, and he <laughs> obviously wasn't used to like 13 year old being like, hey, do you have some questions? And um, my question was, and this is a question that I ask every rabbi that I that I come across. Um, why is it that in, in kind of kashrut and keeping kosher, you aren't allowed to mix milk and meat because it's mm -hmm. the calf and its mother's milk, but you're allowed to mix chicken and eggs. So that seems weirder and worse and like more kind of messed up. Um, why? And he was like, I could give you some books that have the answer to this, but like, I don't know. Why are you asking that question? So I always, I always was interested in, in kind of the study of why. And when I went to college, I was convinced that I was going to be an English major because um, I was told by my parents and a lot of teachers in high school that, you know, my my key interests, which at the time were art history and philosophy in high school, um, were not going to make me money. <laughs> and he said, you know, not like English was going to, but I was like, I'm definitely majoring in something humanities related. So when I, you know, went into college, I was like, all right, I'm going to be an English major. And I took a philosophy class and an, uh, an art history class. And it was like the basic kind of survey art history class that you had to take for the major. And I took it and, and it was billed as like the worst art history class. And I took some philosophy class too that was like billed like the worst philosophy. Like on Rate My Professor or what? Just by like people at at Smith. They were like, oh, you know, this this class is kind of BS. Like don't, don't um, you know, if you're interested in being a major, like don't take these classes as like examples of the way that things are. So I took these classes and realized like 15 minutes into the first class like shit okay like i can't be an english major <laughs> like this is what i'm actually really passionate about and it wasn't until i took i took probably my favorite class that i've ever taken um in college and it was an aesthetics class um which is that class that that we're kind of talking about the philosophy yeah. of art and the professor was this like incredible woman who um, was a philosopher and an artist, and her husband was a um, was a chemistry professor at Smith, and and the two of them would travel the world, and it was all about kind of like the class itself was about intersectionality and kind of where um, you know art and philosophy meld. And I realized at that moment I was like, okay, I 
love art and I love art history. I, and, and this was, I think my sophomore year of college. And at the time I was kind of grappling with like, what am I gonna do with my life? What career am I gonna do? Cause I'm always a person that's like thinking five years ahead, like for better or for worse. And in that class, the real study was like, why do people make art? And why do people appreciate art? And, you know, what is that motivating factor that like, you know, brings people together under this kind of auspice of art and they go to museums and look at these objects or, you know, go to the streets and paint murals or graffiti. And I was like, okay, this is what I'm interested in um, right here. So I ended up, um, the Smith kind of opened this program my my freshman or sophomore year um, that was like a museum's concentration. And I was mm -hmm. like, okay, museums, like that seems like a, again, like practical. I'm like, what is my job gonna be like? Museums. And so I did this project about um, like museum education and museum marketing. And marketing, it was, that was my first time really delving into marketing and thinking about marketing. And I went into it thinking about it from that aesthetics perspective. like. Art really to me is, you know, when an artist makes something, the point is to like get people to react to it. And um, for better or for worse, you know, like my mom is an artist and she will say like, no, like I do art for art's sake and I, I don't do it for other people. And, but I think, you know, garnishing reaction and, and, and reacting to what's happening around you is just like what making art is about. And I think, you know, not to, elevate marketing to some lofty crazy place no go for it go for it <laughs> what it is but to me and and what it is you know what makes me really excited about marketing in general um is you know really what we do as marketers and we'll get into my job later i guess but um is get people look we're, we're we're using visuals to convince people and and uh, to do something to make them feel something to evoke emotion and that was the most kind of exciting thing to me about aesthetics and, and the philosophy of art and and you know that's the root of of it all for me and that's what gets me kind of like the most excited that it's what so beautiful it yeah it, uh, I'm going to get to that. It, <laughs> it's so beautiful. You, you touched on a number of things. The thing that struck me is that I knew several of these things, um, but not necessarily in that order. And mm -hmm. it, I didn't realize how sequential they were. Like the way yeah. you put it there, they're a lot more connected. Like there's one thread that you could almost, you know, easily trace from bat mitzvah to your mm -hmm. career now. And and it's crazy that it, it has to do with this examination of of critical thinking, this this asking of of these these deep questions about you know nearly everything, but but especially you know of the the things that shine, the things that are that are pretty, that are aesthetically pleasing. One of the things, um, just to go back, just so we don't mm -hmm. pass it up, I could I think partially answer the question that used to answer all the rabbis. And I think we've talked about this before, but yeah. it may have been a number of years. What's fascinating, and and you you know that um, I'm a big fan of of the Semitic languages as a as this giant family. I'm a native speaker of Amharic, which is the second most commonly spoken Semitic language. And then you know my my love affair with Gitz, which is my my mm -hmm. church language, but then also this summer, I've learned the the Hebrew Aleph Bet, which was, of course, the the script pick up picked up by the Hebrews in in Babylonian captivity. There's even older Paleo Hebrew scripts that you and I have joked about, almost look like Lord of the Rings. And I might yeah. have to go, I might have to go learn the Paleo Hebrew one day, one day too. So at least one author I know that that has studied that. But um, one of those obscure ones that usually only academics study within the Semitic language family branch is Ugarit. And there's a there's a scholar, Mitchell Dahoud, but there, there are several others. There's one, Ola Wakander, that I follow now, who are Ugarit scholars, you know, <laughs> as if all the languages they know wasn't enough. Okay. They study this, this language, it's not studied by anyone. But 
one of the striking things, and it's not one to one, but it's it's a similar to that, like those Canaanite language branches. So especially like a closer version, like closer than even Arabic in, in some ways to, to Hebrew. And they, they found out something that, you know, you understand when you study the, the Pentateuch, when you study the first five books uh, of Toha, mm -hmm. of the, the law or the instruction, which is that in Deuteronomy 5, you find a repeat of what's in Exodus 20, which is the Ten Commandments. And then from Deuteronomy 5 to Deuteronomy 34, you have over 600 expansions upon the the uh, Ten Commandments. And then, of course, later, you know, you have the Talmudic um, text and all the different uh, opinions of the of the rabbis over the ages who are interpreting all of this. So we know that all of it goes back to the Ten Commandments. And what they found through Ugaritic studies was that the bathing of the the animal in the milk somehow was part of the the cultic worship of other gods. Mm -hmm. And so so that that makes sense for this oddity because like if we just take it from a purely logical standing, I think like your logic is impeccable. If if the reason behind not yeah. having meat with cheese is that you're bathing you know the mother in the in the child's you know like mm -hmm. nefesh or life breath yeah. somehow then there's got to be something wrong about chicken and eggs like there's yeah. something's got to be off there yeah but um you know if it's the case that the reason that's banned is because there were no chicken and egg deities being sacrificed to but there happened to be like some some goat and milk deity or or something like that 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 makes sense and um so to answer your question i have had this uncontrollable desire i think like like you've said to want to know why to the yeah. point of annoying most people and i think um there are pretty much no people who are neutral regarding me i think they either hate me or love me because i will you know think critically about like the food that i eat you know, the art that I consume, you know, like I'm just watching some shows on HBO and Netflix and I'm trying to have like a critical opinion where other people are just trying to consume it. But that's such a waste though. Cause like the thing is these creators don't create this content for people to just sit there like slack jawed and like, all right, like I'm just <laughs> absorbing all of this stuff. Like no one creates anything. And this goes back to aesthetics, like for people to not feel something or like, think something like the the big thing um, and my job I'll you know is, is I work for I'm director of strategy at a social media agency that focuses on entertainment so a big part of my job is like marketing these shows on HBO and on Netflix and the thing that I use or the, the kind of statement that I say all the time when you know pitching to these clients and, and letting them know like what our overall strategies are and, and this is the goal of my company and the goal of I think you know, social media marketing in general is creating community and, you know, encouraging people to have conversation around this piece of art that is being put out into the world. And for these creators or distributors, like, you know, when looking at the movie studios and TV studios, conversation is capital for them because mm -hmm. people are just sitting there and letting a show be absorbed into their brain and are not asking questions about it and talking about it for better or for worse. Like the only people that are going to know about the show are the people that are watching it in that moment. So, you know, if one person is, is talking, like I saw you like did your review of young Pope, that's amazing for HBO because <laughs> if you know, like the a hundred plus people or thousand plus people who end up watching that review are like, you know, hey, I've never heard of that show, or I watched one episode and didn't really love it, but now this guy's opinion makes me want to go back and watch it again, whether I agree with him or not. Like, that's money in their pocket and kind of makes the, the showrunners and the actors feel good. That's why I think, like, even things that as seemingly, like, one-dimensional and kind of lame as, like, 90 Day Fiance or... Um, like Tiger King, like these are things that created like so much conversation and made people oh, yeah. think so much and talk so much. And that's, you know, you can call it like trash TV or whatever, but it's culture capital. It's like become ingrained in like what, you know, we as a society call a society. 
Um, but kind of going back also to this kind of overarching idea of marketing and, and mm -hmm. I didn't even really think about this connection all that much. Um, my husband and I were like talking about like what I would maybe be talking about during this podcast. And one of the things that, that we, you know, we're talking about is this idea of like marketing and religion. Mm -hmm. And what you're yeah. talking about is such a good example of that because, you know, I used to think about it a lot in the context of Christianity, right? Because there's a lot of things that exist in Judaism that don't exist in Christianity. Orthodox Christianity, I think, is slightly different, but in kind of the more traditional Protestant or even, ca you know, Catholic branches of Christianity, there are things that don't exist that, you know, existed in Judaism. Um, and they don't exist in Christianity, essentially, or to, you know, you are obviously more knowledgeable about this than I am, but to my knowledge, they don't exist just because it was obnoxious to do them. And it was easier to convert Romans to Christianity by saying, hey, the Jewish people, you know, we believe in the same God as the Jews, but you don't have to circumcise your babies and you don't have to follow this new dietary restriction. Um, join our club. It's easier over here. And, you know, it's kind of the same way for the Jews who pride themselves, obviously, on being like this non-proselytizing religion. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, in order to survive, you know, and the differentiation in this case is survival, um, they had to, you know, market the religion by saying, hey, you know, you might be bathing your calves in your mother's milk, but, you know, our religion over here, skip that part. <laughs> like, yeah. Our God doesn't need you to do that. Um, Are you talking about like diversity between uh, like Jewish sex? Like I always, I always tell people, and they have such a hard time believing this or understanding this. Even though I think on a like on a basic level, people understand the basic premise. Like Christianity, like comes out of Judaism in a very direct way. Like yeah. Jesus and almost all of the apostles depending on how you define that term were were jewish you know so, some of them were even rabbis in addition yeah. to that so like even in the context of like christianity there were like five different main branches of judaism i, I know like nowadays there are like three big ones but you could you could cut some of them up into further like subsections so is, is that yeah. what you mean is like different yeah. versions of Exactly. Yeah. And it's, I think that it, it, back then I'm assuming, and I don't know that it was probably a little bit more like homogenized. Like I'm sure in order to like create the religion or start it, there had to kind of be one core, like this is what it means to be Jewish. And then when, and, and it has to be markedly different than what it means to be, you know, polytheistic religion X. Mm -hmm. Um, and then once there were enough people that defined themselves that way, they started to kind of break off. I think now the, the and it's, it's, it's interesting, like the main differences that I kind of witness is there's, you know, the Orthodox Judaism, the Orthodox Judaism, conservative reform, and then within conservative and reform, which have now like over the last like 20, 30 years kind of, almost melded into one like pseudo conservative reform really yeah it's it, they've it's really become very very similar and when you ask rabbis about it now they say that the reason why it's so similar is because they need to um it's it's not necessarily this like makes it sound like it's so divisive but like to kind of combat how intense like the orthodox side of of things are mm -hmm. um just because there are there's not there's not like hate between the orthodox jews and and reform and conservative jews but there is like a little bit of judgment that like yeah and, and this is just speaking personally like within my own family like my um mom's side of the family um is is like my my grandparents parents were orthodox and then my grandparents were reconstructionist which to my great grandparents was like as if they converted to another religion or like, <laughs> like said you know screw you to judaism that um, was the rebellious thing of their time 
totally to be like super conservative Jews. Like we, you know, and it's, they, they, they say that, you know, Judaism keeps getting like diluted, you know, all religion. It's like, you know, the young, the younger generations don't want to do it the way their parents did. And then it's like, where does the religion go? Like everyone becomes mm -hmm. atheist, which I think is kind of bullshit, but um, it's, it, it definitely, there is kind of this weird schism -y feeling thing between the Orthodox and the reform and conservatives, but something else, the another kind of split is like, a geographical split. So there's the um, Ashkenazi Jews who are Eastern European, and then the Sephardic Jews who, it's interesting because Sephardic, the, the root of it means like coming from Spain, um, mm -hmm. which is, is interesting because my dad is North African, but like considers himself Sephardic. Um, yeah. And I guess like if you go back far enough, you can say like, oh, you know, he comes from Spaniards who had to escape Spain during the Crusades and they went up to North Africa or went down to North Africa. Um, but it's... And there's a lot of mixing over the time, right? Like yeah. places like Tunisia and Morocco and Algeria and Libya, you know, notoriously look a little different than other like sub-Saharan Africans because of proximity yeah. to the Mediterranean. And it, it wasn't like one directional, like it was in, in two directions, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so it's, um, but what's interesting is that, you know, Jews from Yemen, Jews from, um, from Iraq and Iran in the US, for the most part, consider themselves Sephardic Jews. And there's like Sephardic mm -hmm. synagogues that are like, you know, and it, I don't know if all of those Jews originated from Spain, but the, the main no, difference. Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> think so. I've heard the term Mizrahi. Is yeah, that so different? In no. regards to the Yemeni, like like what you've said. No, so I think that there are some um, Jews that are like of Middle Eastern descent that define themselves as being Mizrahi. I think that like mm -hmm. my dad probably like could if he, you know, because people don't really know what their real like background. I mean, with 23andMe and stuff now, you can figure it out. But it's, it's one of those kind of great mysteries. Um, but I think culturally at least the way that I understand being Sephardic, um, Mizrahi Ju Judaism and Sephardic Judaism are really similar. And, and mm -hmm. in terms of like the text and the Talmud and all that stuff, like it's the same. Um, and the way that like the text is interpreted for the most part, there's like some funny rules. Like um, my mom um, is Ashkenazi obviously, and my dad is Sephardic and in um for passover when you're ashkenazi you can't have rice but mm -hmm. when you're Sephardic, you can and okay. my mom tells like another funny story that like when my grandfather when my mom got married to my dad my grandfather said okay but you have to promise me one thing you won't eat rice on passover <laughs> <laughs> that's really a deal breaker yeah that's a deal breaker so right there. You don't. um but i was talking to a friend earlier um a few few weeks ago um, and he was saying that apparently really observant Jews love to go to Israel during um, Passover because many of the Israelis there follow the Sephardic kosher rules so they can eat rice. <laughs> and so they're like, oh, we get to, <laughs> we can eat rice if we're in Israel. Um, but Are they more Sephardic there in Israel? Yeah. Is that, so, well, the, what's the, like, I've never like even looked at like the demographics in terms of It's really of interesting actually. So it's, and, and this is like a, it's not controversial, but it's, it's a, it's an opinion. The, the class split in Israel, not so much anymore, but like 20, 30 years ago was, you know, if you go look at the universities, the Ashkenazi Jews who immigrated to Israel, like, you know, in the fifties from Canada, England, um, you know, Australia, Australia, even they um, were the doctors and the lawyers and went to the universities. And um, I have cousins on my mom's side who speak English perfectly without an accent, but were born in Israel, have lived in Israel wow. their whole life. Um, and they're like, for all intents and purposes, white, like, and considered to be so. Um, the Israelis who immigrated post World War II from like Iraq, Yemen, Iran, North Africa. My my dad actually went to high school in Israel, and and my grandparents lived there until they died. Um, 
they are ostensibly the, the brown people um, mm -hmm. and were not ghettoized, but definitely placed in the Arab neighborhoods um, because according to my dad, and this is him kind of being very generous about the Israeli government, um, the cultures were really similar. So the idea was like, oh, hey, like you both like eat flat bread and stews, like let's put you in the same neighborhood and you'll get along fine. And, and you know, it, it so it's because of that, there are neighborhoods in Israel um, that are really, really Sephardic. Um, and there are neighborhoods in Israel that lean more Ashkenazi. Um, and then but, the Ethiopians just confused the picture further, <laughs> I imagine. So they just the, come out of nowhere and like, we're Jewish too. And then yeah, exactly. people do like, DNA yeah. tests and they're like, uh, your DNA is kind of different, but yeah, come on over, you get Aaliyah. So what's interesting is I read this article um, a couple of days ago, actually, about um, racism in Israel. And racism within the Jewish community, it was, you know, it was born from like the BLM movement and it was written by an Ethiopian Jew. And she was saying that over the last, you know, 20 years since like kind of the Ethiopians made Aliyah and I think it was 1990, right? It was like the bear 1991 or something. They started the in the in the 80s, but yeah, I think they went till the 90s. They had two projects. One I think was Project Moses, the other Project Solomon. And mm -hmm. so I think from the 80s and the 90s, they were continuously. So this article was was saying essentially that now that, you know, um, the, you know, Middle Eastern Jews in Israel who who were kind of not they kind of relegated to being considered less elite than the white Israelis um, started to kind of make more money and, and rise through the ranks. And, and culturally, Israel has kind of become associated more with the like Sephardic side of things mm -hmm. um food and you know there's like the falafel and it's it's become a little bit more um you know Middle Eastern skewing the Ethiopian Jews are feeling a lot of discrimination now because they have kind of like taken that spot as being the you know um the brown people in the community so it it's it, but definitely an interesting place, and I think it's an, it because it's such a new country, we're able to kind of see these things happen, you know, faster than than they happened here. Um, Meaning, but like social mobility, both social mobility and um, kind of the how quick the um, prejudice is born. You know, it it kind of it, it's it's interesting, and it's I, I haven't spent a lot of time there. Yeah. And I'm definitely not an expert at all, um, other than just like having family that lives there and stuff. But the, the article was really interesting. And I think like Ethiopian Jewry in general is really, really interesting and like learning about like the lost tribe and like, what does that mean? And, and then, the, you know, something that we've talked about a lot is how similar Ethiopian Orthodoxy and um, Judaism are and how there are so many similarities, both like in the language and you know, culture and how, um, you know, that is just talking, talking about religion with you is always really fun because there's so many like cool connections that can be made between. Yeah, it's bizarre. Like some of the stuff seems, you know, accidental or providential, you know, what you, whatever you believe about that. Whereas some of the stuff seems intentional. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like some of the stuff, it seems like, by virtue of, you know, living in general proximity to the region and being Semitic language speakers, that that cultural element was the same. And then other stuff just looks like like it was mimicked intentionally. Like one of, I don't know if you've ever heard, one of the minor theories of the Ethiopian uh, Jewry is that there are actually Christians that during a medieval theological crisis said, F it, we're going back to Judaism and just okay. like converted so, back to Judaism, you know, and, and that that's not proven, but it's it's one of like two or three main theories. And there's so little information in yeah. terms of like, like genuine artifacts and proof, as opposed to just like, you know, what do people say? Like, what are oral traditions? And so the date they have is between the 400s and like the 1300s. So they don't know if like, they're Christians who decided to become Jewish in the 1300s, or if they're uh, like 
Jews that came over from the 400s. And there's so many things that complicated because like the closest Jews to the Ethiopian Jews are the Yemeni. And so you would think like, like maybe like it was a bunch of early Yemeni Jews. Like that seems to me to be like one of the most plausible things, like maybe some Yemenis, maybe some Syria, Syria, like some Levantine Jews came over at some point, like early on and just lived in a small communities and kind of gradually, because even now it's like 200,000 of them, which is, you know, in a country of 110 million, it's, it's not a large, you know, part of the population. Um, but they did, I, re I read an academic paper just a couple weeks ago that went through the DNA that they tested. And, you know, they didn't test everybody, but they tested like sample sizes and they found like no matches between the Yemenis and the Ethiopians. No, it's and it's just so like, it no, just, it, it, you it, just, I don't know, you know, I just, I really don't know. Yeah, it's the coolest thing ever. I mean, anyway, I, I think it is. I nerd out about that kind of stuff all the time. It's like my favorite. Are, are people mixing? You know, um, you know, I think about like, it's interesting you say that the Sephardic, like it sounds like you were saying the Ashkenazi culture was dominant originally in the founding of the state of Israel. But but now as time goes on, the Sephardic one, I don't know if people are just moving more from Muslim countries or, or what's going on, is becoming stronger. I knew that to be the case in the cuisine. And yeah. I know some people get into arguments about that when people say like, what's Israeli food versus what yeah. comes from somewhere it's else. Right. Stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, but then... I've seen it linguistically too. If I'm not mistaken, there's like less Yiddish being used and more of like, almost like a, like a, you could call it like a new conservatism to like focus more on Hebrew itself and uh, rather than like, you know, this, this uh, variant of, of German, which is what uh, Yiddish and, and Ashkenazi speakers mostly new but are, are the Ashkenazi and Sephardic like I see Netanyahu is more like you he's he's half and half if I'm not mistaken or he's like three-fourths and a fourth I'm, I, I forget the exact but I know he's some mix of Sephardic and Ashkenazi and are the three like uh I, I don't know if Mizrahi counts as one and then Ethiopian is like its own category at least know, it's like I, two to four <laughs> I think so my mom says that like when she married my dad it was not like scandalous but it was more rare for you know like conservative Ashkenazi people to marry Sephardic people and I mm -hmm. think in the U.S. part of that was because like the Sephardic communities were like really self-contained and the Ashkenazi communities were really self-contained. Like you go to different synagogues and like you, you know, you don't usually go to Hebrew school together. Um, wow. Back then. Now it's a little bit more mixed. There are still Sephardic synagogues. And like, if you ask my dad today, like he feels more comfortable going to like the Chabad, which is its own thing and it's Orthodox, but the Chabad mm -hmm. that is near us happens to be like led by a Sephardic rabbi versus going to like a conservative synagogue that is, um, you know, like, uh, like an Ashkenazi rabbi and stuff. Um, and so I think in the last like 20, 30 years, like since, since my parents got married, I think it's gotten more normal. There's kind of this like generation of, I remember I had like a t-shirt when I was a kid that I got at some like day camp, like Jewish day camp that said, I was like, I'm Ashkafardic. And it's like, Sephardic and Ashkenazi mixed together. And there's yeah. there's a lot of kids that are, I think are like that. Um, and it just That's like- more shalom. Yeah, exactly. Like United Colors of Benetton. Um, but it, I think, um, I don't know about Ethiopian Jews mixing. I, I, I don't know. I think- Maybe it goes back to the newness that you're talking about. Like it, it remains to be seen. Yeah, it's an interesting like microcosm. Um, cause like what people say about, you know, the boiling pot theory of America, yeah. one of the issues why, well, first of all, some people are offended by that because, you know, they want integration more than assimilation. And I know there are arguments between that mm -hmm. and, um, you know, rather than having like one monoculture, they'd rather have a bunch of diverse cultures. But the interesting thing about the state of Israel is like one religion. Yeah. And so because of that, you know, there's uh at least one level of the culture that is going to be inherently monoculture and homogenized so it it would be interesting to see especially with like a smaller sample size right the the population is far less than the united states if like in 50 years like there was like like you couldn't tell whether someone was one of those four group like it was just everybody was mixed of of all of those things and, um, and 
interesting too is when you speak to people who don't like know Judaism, being Jewish is just being Jewish. Like it doesn't matter. And and to them, it's just it being Jewish just means you're not Christian almost. It's like there isn't this, you know, analysis of like what it, what being Jewish means. <laughs> the focus is on like what makes it different from Christianity. It's like, oh, you like you diet and you, you know, follow these rules and you have this thing called Shabbat and the Sabbath and you don't go to church, you go to synagogue. It's like the focus is on the differences and not so much on like what makes being like what makes Judaism Judaism. Um, and I think part of what makes me appreciate being Jewish um, is, and this goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning, is that while there are these rules that are hard and fast and we have these commandments and they exist, we have stuff like the Talmud where it's like scholars literally just arguing with each other <laughs> over yeah. what stuff means, which is great because it intrinsically like calls it all into question which seems counterproductive with the religion because it's like, you know, like these are rules and guidelines and this is like, you know, about creating order. But I think what's cool about Judaism is it like creates this fun sense of like disorder where you're constantly asking like why all the time. Um, and because that's like the, the scholars are doing that. Like these Orthodox communities have these rabbis who all they do all day long is sit and like read these texts and like analyze every word and try to figure out like hidden meanings with numerology and like, you know, did this guy say this, but he actually meant this. And like, what does this, you know, what did he mean when he said this? And um, kind of this constant questioning is, is something that like for me is, is just the cool part is that like none of it's concrete and, that's why I, this is like another kind of weird fact about myself, but I hate math, like hate it. I've hated it my whole life. And I'm convinced that the reason why I hate it so much is because it's so concrete. You like can't question it. It's not like I can't like bullshit two plus two to equal something that isn't four. So that frustrates me. And I'm like, okay, no, like I don't even want to touch this because it's there. It's too concrete. Um, yeah. That's very funny that you said that because I very much loved it as a kid. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I had one, yeah, math because of its concreteness and its objectivity. But at one point in high school, I had one teacher who turned me off from it. And out mm -hmm. of spite, I strayed away from the human, uh, excuse me, I strayed away from STEM in college. And I went almost, you know, all in on humanities and a little bit of social science. And then, you know, where I excelled the most were, were in like the humanities, which is like where you and I are are linking up again. And I, I felt like deficient partially in the past 10 years because I neglected that. And I, I you know, was immature, but I was also like 16, yeah. 15, like what can you expect at the time? But yeah, for the same reason, I, I, I like the humanities for, you know, that it allows you room to keep questioning and, and debating. And, and that culture is so rigorous. It's encapsulated in what was Pepperdine's model that, that the truth has nothing to fear from investigation. Like yeah. if you're confident in your religion, if you have like no reason to doubt your, your like jewelry or, you know, or your, your deity, right? If you have no reason to, to doubt uh, Elohim, uh, Adonai, then then you're like there's no reason why you wouldn't question because yeah. no matter what answer you get to it's going to lead back to ed on i like that's the yeah. kind of i think confidence that that i see in that and if you just see like you know the milieu in which judaism comes out in and you look at like what happened you know to all the other gods like all the other gods were decimated now now you might attribute a lot of that decimation to islam but yeah. whichever way you cut it like the milieu in which you know Judaism was standing, like a, a lot of these other gods, they're not there anymore. No, and, it's true. We're <laughs> a resilient folk, um, and it's. I think I think part of that comes from the constant questioning and, and adapting, and that is, I think, part of the conflict. And it's interesting with like the Orthodox community and the conservative and reconstructionist community because there's this idea that like you're not doing it right like you're not doing mm. being Jewish right and I have like kind of an intrinsic problem with that because I feel like every person's experience is so unique and and like what you said like if the, the core of it is believing in God and all that other stuff is our interpretation of 
these words, but it's it's within our best interest to keep questioning. And as we learn more stuff as people and as society, you know, like kind of adapting. Um, and this is obviously just my opinion, but like, you know, adapting, you know, these kind of cultural actions to fit our current everyday life is, is something that I think, you know, in trend, like just it made to me it makes sense. And that's that's the basis of reconstructionism for like to, to my obviously to my understanding of it. I'm not an expert, but um, and that's where you know my grandfather, my mom's dad, he was a doctor and a, he was a scientist and was raised, you know, post Holocaust. You know, he was a Holocaust survivor, and and I think this idea that you know in this world where there's so much bad, like we need to, you know make this religion fit today um, in a way that that prevents us from like questioning everything. Um, and that, you know, was definitely integrated into how I kind of view the religion and all of the, you know, fun stuff we do around it. Yeah, I, I think um, there, there's this line that Michael Malice, I don't know if you if you are aware of him, he's Jewish, but definitely does not believe in, in God. He's a political theorist I follow. Um, he's from the Ukraine. So he, you know, escaped Soviet Russia when there was persecution of, of Jews there. But one of the things he says about politics, I think, is related to what you're saying about the religious divide. He says that conservatism is progressivism uh, driving the speed limit. And, you know, the, the reason he says that is he looks at like a, a publication like the National Review. Mm -hmm. And then if you see like what they're writing in 2020 is what like the progressives were, where the progressives were in 1990 or in 1980. So they, you know, they get there, you know, they, they, they play and they faint as if, you know, they're not going to fold, but, you know, they're eventually you know they're playing off each other but he but they're they're giving in and so when you're mentioning the, the deconstructionists and the um like the reformed and the conservative and how they're united against maybe the the orthodoxy which maybe is looking back a lot further than the yeah. conservatives would i i'm wondering is is a lot of like i thought a lot of the difference was around like gender roles and things like that is it yeah. is it is it like theological differences or is it more about like how do we incorporate how, how do we like how are we inclusive of everybody yeah. that's around I, think that, I think that a lot of it is is interpretation and i think a big part of the um you know kind of conservative viewpoint is um and the reform viewpoint too coming from that is like you know, we're living in a society today where like women have rights and like we know that and we know that women are, you know, just as capable as men are. And that's not to say that people that are orthodox don't believe that they, they genuinely do, but they feel like the tradition supersedes their knowledge of that. So it's not like, you know, making the men and women sit separate in synagogue or not letting women go up to touch the Torah, like, you know, orthodox Jews um, often, you know, really, um, very, um, I'm, I want to use the word conservative, but it's confusing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very, ultra, very. Ultra, that, I hear the word ultra a lot. I haven't heard you exactly, use it before, yeah, like, but I've, I've heard that before. And ultra Orthodox Jews don't let women get bat mitzvah. Like the bat mitzvah, the, 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 the female version of the bar mitzvah is the thing that was created by the conservative movement. Oh, no way. I yeah. never knew that. Yeah, I so never like, knew that. Yeah, women are not allowed. The, it's called the wow. bima, but it's the place where the Torah is. Women are in an orthodox, an ultra orthodox synagogue. Women aren't allowed there. Um, and it's and it's not to say like my mom will be like, oh, it's because they're sexist. But like I don't think that that's what it is. It's just that the the cultural the the importance of keeping the culture alive supersedes our knowledge about you know, how important women are and, and how capable we are. And um, it's, you know, women will, will study together, but there's like parts of the Torah that like women can't study if you're, if you're ultra Orthodox. Um, so I think it's, it's more about maintaining um, like a sense of purity, like really holding all of these um, different rituals sacred and trying to do them as close to the letter as possible. 
so that it doesn't get diluted and eventually disappear. Kind of like what I was saying at the beginning, how like, you know, you get married and you have kids and you're like, oh, you know, instead of like, for example, like, I grew up in a house where we had two sets of dishes and two sets mm -hmm. of forks and knives, like one for meat and one for milk. Um, my, my grandma too, by the way. Oh, oh interesting. See? <laughs> but not, not based off like uh, meat and milk. There are certain fasting periods where you're supposed to be like vegan. Oh, so my grandmother would like, if it was a time to be vegan, she would not let you cook the food in the same kitchen. See, that's so, that, that's one of those things where it's like that has to, that act of like the dishes like getting dirty from the yeah. thing, like that has to be connected somehow. You know what, honestly, maybe it was like some old polytheistic thing. Like we don't even know, like the root of it could exist far before any of these monotheistic religions existed. But that's like one of those, a perfect example of like one of those interesting, like weird connections. But anyway, when, you know, I got married and moved into my house. Like we have one set of dishes and I don't have a cheeseburger on them, but I have one set. And so it could be argued that like our daughter like might eat a cheeseburger because we, you know what I'm saying? Cause we like diluted the the purity of the ritual. So I think, you know, it's, I, I can see both sides of the argument and it's, it's, a, a complex thing and, and and thinking about it critically, like talking about it, like doing what we're doing, I think only like makes the gap between the sects of the religion smaller and, and there's a sense of understanding. Like I'm not gonna sit here and say that like ultra Orthodox Jews are sexist or that they're like, you know, antiquated or whatever. It's, it's I think I can, I can see where it's coming from and why, um, you know, these traditions still exist and there's value in that. Um, it's just, there's this idea of, you know, people having free choice and they can do what they want to do. And, um, you know, I like that. I think you put it very amicably, like for not being there, like that's probably the most charitable, you know, presentation of, you know, an opposition that I've ever seen. <laughs> and especially, you know, one that is like attacking our sensibilities as modernists or postmodernists or whatever we are. And um, what's most interesting is, and this is just an educated guess on my part as someone who's like obsessed with language and things like that. Yeah. I think that your point about emphasis and distinction and being set apart is right. And mm -hmm. I think that perhaps the conservative and the reformed, you know, would have let Hebrew as itself, like as a language, be lost to the ages because even before 200, 300 years before Jesus, there's a thriving Jewish community in Alexandria, mm -hmm. Egypt. And they had so profusely been poor at their Hebrew studying and their, their Hebrew school that they needed the, the Septuagint to be translated. Mm -hmm. So they translated the Tanakh into the Greek language because they were Hellenized Jews. And that's in, in you know, 200 before the yeah. common era. You know, let let alone like two millennia plus later, there's something about the ultra orthodox that it's uh, you know I think if nothing else because of them Hebrew is still here. Well, that's like, the whole thing. I think that there's value, and it's interesting. I've never really thought about it this way, but with like there's value in having it's not even a schism, but but having these different kind of sects of Judaism or or levels of practice, just because of what you're saying. Like if you go to a reform synagogue, like half of the, you know, um, services are in English. Mm -hmm. And that's on one hand, and I know we've talked about this before with your church and Amaric and this idea or goes too, that there's value in it being in English because that means more people can understand and participate. Um, and it's not alienating, but there's also kind of what you're saying where the, the the language will die if people don't use it. And obviously Hebrew, like it's, there's a whole country that speaks that language now, but you know, using it in this kind of religious setting is, is important. Um, but there's a level of alienation that comes with it too, where you're looking at this book and, First of all, you opened it the wrong way and, you know, the wrong way. Yeah. 
the letters don't look like English letters and it's like um, the barrier to entry is like ridiculously high. So it makes sense as again, a marketer, like how do you lower the barrier to entry? How do you get as many people as possible to like feel something? Um, and it, that makes, it makes sense to me. But at the same time, I also see the value in, in you know, maintaining a sense of, um, you know, the past and, and, having this language that unifies like so many different types of people. Like we were talking about people from Canada and people from Yemen that are like living in the same country, speaking the same language. Like that's cool. Um, and something that you don't see a lot. So like they're, they're all united. And then this will be a good segue to bring it back actually to marketing. Yeah. They're all united. And I, I heard this podcast from a few Hebrew scholars probably a couple months ago now, you know, Time flies differently in the midst of the plague. But yeah. uh, they were talking about Hashem, the name, and and not using the Lord's name in vain, right? Mm -hmm. One of the, the Ten Commandments that we find in Exodus 20 and, and Deuteronomy 5. And they said that a lot of people misunderstand this. And it, it's always been interesting, you know, to me in like Black American culture or even WASP culture, which um, I, I think we were, you know, referencing earlier, like, like a lot of times, you know, Judaism was thought of in negation rather than like treated as its own subject. And and I would say a lot of things. I, I think it's the WASP culture, right? The dominant American culture, that puritanical culture was the WASP culture. So, you know, the the Irish and Italian Catholics, the the Jews and the blacks, like and anyone who was pariah or outside of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, for that matter, you know, women at the time, non-property mm -hmm. owners, like anyone who's outside of that that purview is like constantly like that's where um you know i know a lot of times it's caricatured but the idea of privilege you know yeah. the kind of wisdom of it if we're being as charitable to those original ideas as possible it's just like the idea that they don't have to think about their identity whereas other people are are having to but um the thing they were saying about the lord's name not using it in vain i think you'll find very interesting is that the name hashem is not just like okay that's like your name like that's where the the presence was because the jewish god unlike all the other gods didn't have a statue you know it's uh is un it's not permitted to to make a statue because that's an idol so you have an invisible deity and so where do you find them well yeah. you find them in the people and so that his presence is amidst the people wherever his name is and that's not just like magic where you can just make an incantation because you know he speaks already in, in deuteronomy and in jeremiah where the people's not just private parts but their lips are uncircumcised mm -hmm. their heart is uncircumcised and so the people who are not who are using the lord's name in vain are the people who are mismarketing him Mm -hmm. who are terrible strategists that mm -hmm. the entire people of God are supposed to be digital and physical strategists. Mm -hmm. And some of them run poor campaigns and some of them run excellent campaigns. So I've, you know, I've used that then to kind of imprint upon, um, you know, the, the flock that, that I minister to in the Ethiopian Orthodox community, uh, Orthodox Christian, I have to say, cause we're talking about Orthodox issues too. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you had ever, you know, thought of it that way that that each person who who's, you know, who utters with their lips that they are a member of a religion in, in some sense of the word. Maybe we're abusing the word. You could tell us if we're abusing the, the term of your field, but is a marketer or is yeah. a strategist. Yeah, I think that I think that in, in a certain way, anyone who feels passionately about anything um is is in a lot of ways a marketer because you're you know trying to take that thing and you're trying to elevate it and i think about debate a lot um because to me debate is really two people taking a topic and trying to see like who can like market that topic better um and that's what i feel like i'm doing constantly all the time is and i've i've marketed a lot of different types of things. I worked initially with um, talent. So I was marketing people, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, you know, with social media specifically, like 
helping to craft like what their presence looks like online. So figuring out like the words to say and the pictures to post and you know how to best like represent this person so that people follow them and buy their crap and watch their movies and think that they're the best. Um, and I've, I've marketed food products, I've marketed coffee, I've marketed, I did a, a marketing thing for the ad council where I marketed the idea of not drinking and driving. Um, so I Great think idea. <laughs> it's, it's just such a broad term that I think can be applied to like every, every person. Um, and I, you know, when people ask me like, oh, so you're, you know, how did you become a strategist? And like, where do you, because, you know, what is your, and I think the term strategist, I think is even more confusing than the term marketer. Cause it, even in like the job world, um, you know, like whenever I was looking for work and I, I've worked with a couple of like headhunters and stuff and they would bring me these jobs and they're like, oh, you're a strategist. Like here's like this analytical, qual you know, quantitative, crazy numbers job and i'm like no mm -hmm. like that's not what i do and it's like okay but like that's like digital strategy is like you know analyzing all this data and coming up with a thing and i'm like yeah that's kind of what i do but it's it's not really and it's i think you know this idea of being a strategist is, is what we were talking about before with like critical thinking and, and integrating that question of why and that's when i'm when i'm telling people about my job that's you know how I describe it is I literally sit around all day and ask why, like, why is, is someone going to want to watch this movie? Like, why is someone going to want to care about this show or this episode of this show or this movie trailer that we're putting up to sell this movie? Um, and, you know, putting on all of the different hats I can you know, this, this is this person's why this is this person's why this is this person's why they're all of these kind of micro communities that make up our society. And each one of, you know, each member of each one of these communities has a different why. Um, and it's impossible to know all the whys, obviously. Um, but to me, like to be a good strategist and to be a good marketer is to really, you know, think about how to capitalize on those whys and, and create content that you know, speaks to as many of those different communities as possible um, to, you know, kind of bring, bring that across. Um, and I've never really sat down and like analyzed how I got here before, but I think thinking about religion, thinking about the Talmud and thinking about, you know, how I was raised and all of that, that asking of why and critical thinking, I think has been ingrained in, in who I am forever. And I think going back way back to the very beginning of our conversation, like of aesthetics, I think why it was my favorite class ever was because I was an art history major and an art historian. And, and to me, what was less important than, you know, the year something was painted or who painted it or whatever was why, like, what was there a war going on? What was the, you know, the, the, the why was to me the meat of it all. Um, which is what makes me excited about doing my job every day. And, and I think it's, it's really easy to look at something like social media and think that it's really vapid and um, superficial. And I think a lot of like, especially not to like hate on boomers or anything, but like, you know, the, the older generation is like, you know, oh, it's all like crap or I don't want people advertising to me. I hear that a lot, like from, you know, my parents and my parents' peers, like, doesn't it bother you how, you know, you're being marketed to all the time, 24 seven. And I'm like, not really, you know, I think that that's just the nature of living in, in this society and social media for all it's worth. It's like, it can be scary, but the benefits to me, like in, in bringing people together and like creating these communities totally outweighs the negative. Um, and I'm in it. So that's probably why I feel that way. Um, but like, I'm not afraid of the fact that Facebook knows more about me than I do. Like, great, serve me ads that will make me buy stuff. Like, I would rather that than see stuff that doesn't apply to me. <laughs> um, yeah, although sometimes with the third party data, it feels like Westworld. 
Yes. I'm uh, I, I, like, <laughs> I, and I know we're both fans of that show. It's one of the shows we watch together. So yeah. I, I'm with you, you know, social media is, is functional. It's, it's how we use it. And honestly, it's, it's too late, you know, boomer or not. I, I've seen other people, you know, for piety reasons and not just for old age reasons, for piety reasons, step away. I've had moments where I've wanted to step away too. And then I, I turn around and double down and came back. And what eventually convinced me is like, something that uh, Gary Vaynerchuk said, uh, an entrepreneur I follow a lot and also a strategist, mm -hmm. is he, he said, you know, this is the state. You know, people say social media. This is the internet. Like, that's just what the internet looks like now, you know, yeah. in terms of like what, what is online dating. You know, when, do you, when we think of online dating, we think of like the 90s and 2000s, people logging into a website. No, but like online dating is all the apps people are using. So this is just the contemporary form of the internet. This is yeah. where millions of people have already made the decision that they're going to be there. So I felt that if I'm, you know, getting away, what I'm saying is like, I'm uninterested in all of these people. And that's something I, I, I couldn't deal with. And, and even if you say like strategist is more confusing, by the way, I really like it because, and maybe this is another similarity between us growing up, my favorite games were all strategy games, Stratego, yeah. chess, NBA 2K. And it wasn't about going against the computer or playing some story mode. It was seeing the other human being on the other side, you know, asking the questions about the why, what are their motivations? And most importantly, how do I disrupt their rhythm? How do I, you know, <laughs> how do I take them apart? Which maybe is a little bit more hardcore and competitive than, than would be um, strategy. But I, I think uh, a great a great way to to come to a close would be: Could you tell us maybe start with a bad and then end on a good note, so that we end on a on a good note? Could you st tell us either like a strategy that somebody didn't listen to or or didn't end up working out, and then one that went really well obviously like anonymize whatever needs to be anonymized oh, yeah. that that i put into play or just in general it could be in general that way we don't want to um you know po point any fingers or poke so, anyone so one really good one and i'll give i'll give two examples that i had nothing to do with just, just okay. to you know be as you know i don't know um one or that you could or could not have been that you will neither confirm nor deny exactly yeah <laughs> Okay, the first one I'll say I had nothing to do with this. Um, the Pepsi ad that went viral with Kendall Jenner is the perfect example of poor marketing strategy. And I use this as an example a lot when I talk to people who um, work for small brands who are thinking about working with an agency but are not sure um, because they do their marketing in-house. And I... 100% well and I, I used it actually as an example today I spoke to somebody who was working at like an apparel company and was like we have this marketing in-house and for some reason it's not working and we don't really know why and we think we're, we want to go for an with an agency or whatever and the reason why that and just for people who didn't see that commercial it happened during if I'm not mistaken the was it the women's march it was it was on it, it was a, a marketing campaign that came about after one of these huge protests that like systematic protests that happened um you know i want to say like four or five years ago and or three th maybe maybe it was like three years ago and the commercial was all of these protesters protesting with their signs and then kendall jenner comes in with a, and I guess like opens it, someone hands her a Pepsi, she opens the Pepsi and takes a drink and then hands it to like a police officer or somebody that was like uh, on the opposing side of the protest. And then everyone applauds or something like, oh, you know, sexism or racism is solved because of Pepsi. And it was so tone deaf and horrible and got completely roasted. Like it got posted online and then within like an hour, it was, there was a major, major uproar for how kind of tone deaf and awful this, this commercial was. And it was a commercial that probably cost millions of dollars, like not just with Kendall Jenner, but it was this massive set and all these extras and it was just this crazy production. And the reason why this failed 
And you see this happen a lot with these kind of like tone deaf things that happen and, and that, that happened recently too. We saw them on a smaller scale, but we saw a lot of these happen kind of in the wake of, um, you know, a lot of the protests that have been happening recently, like marketers are trying to figure out like, okay, like how do we, like I saw like a manicure, like a nail polish company was like, we are releasing a line of like protest nails and they're like $60 and people were like, what is, this is so tone deaf. And commercialize the revolution. Exactly. And the reason why um, this happened, in my opinion, is because their marketing was in house. They didn't have anybody that had this outsider's perspective that was outside of the brand to say, okay, I see how this, you know, could benefit the brand as a, a you know, Pepsi person people love Pepsi, Pepsi solves your problems, drinking Pepsi outside, look, there's a diverse, you know, it's, it checks off all the boxes, but big picture, like this looks shitty. <laughs> and, you know, I can give you a bunch of examples why, you know, outside of, of Pepsi with a capital P. Um, and that I think is, is where the value of hiring an agency comes in because, you know, I look at, campaigns of brands and entertainment properties and people all day long. So I'm able to like see what works and what doesn't. And because we kind of have our finger on the pulse of like all of these different communities, um, you know, we're able to say like, you know, this might work for this small community, but it's really, really not going to work for all of these other ones. And their voices are really loud. <laughs> so like you need to kind of avoid making this happen. So that's an example of really bad strategy. Um, an example of really good strategy that's really relevant, I think, is um, the K-pop uh, TikTok thing. With saw that. That was like so genius. And my favorite part of this is that it was strategized by a bunch of high school kids. And that makes me feel so excited. TikTok in general makes me feel really excited. Um, not the platform because it's like owned by the Chinese and stuff, but the what it represents to me is this like. So we'll tell the listeners a little bit about the campaign. Okay, yeah. So the campaign was um, a bunch. I think it was. I, I don't. I don't know like how it was started necessarily, but a bunch of like K-pop fans, which on TikTok, which is this community that is super super strong, and one that even as a marketer, like I would not peg them as being a super politicized group just in general, but they're huge and really, really active on the platform. And they kind of came up with this plan to reserve a bunch of seats at the Trump rally to inflate the numbers so that they had extra security and in this kind of overflow area, but they obviously weren't going to go to the rally and thousands and thousands and thousands of kids did this. And it worked. The numbers were crazy inflated and like 6,000 people showed up and Trump looked like an idiot. And it was such a brilliant example of viral marketing. And it's something that we try to replicate like all the time. And it's almost impossible to do. Um, but this generation of, of people, and it's like the younger subset of Gen Z, I feel. These are people who, and we were talking about like the importance of social media and, and there's a lot of negative stuff. And like you read in these like parenting magazines, like, do you get rid of social media for your kids and stuff? But the value of it, I think, is giving these kids the confidence to believe that they can actually change the world because you can get famous in like a second on YouTube. You can, you know, make an Instagram post that goes viral and all of a sudden you're a celebrity and you can like make the president of the United States look dumb. <laughs> like while sitting at home on your couch, like in your PJs, like that's power. And the fact that these young kids feel that power all the time, is scary. Cause like, you know, they're going to be go into the workforce and like, I might be their boss and that's like, gonna suck for me but what's amazing is that there's gonna be this generation of kids of, of adults that grow up with this like sense of confidence and self-assuredness and like creativity like intrinsic creativity this stuff on tiktok if you scroll through it's insane i couldn't think about half of this stuff um it it gives me and this like is sappy and or whatever but it like gives me hope for like 
the future. Like I, we, we had a baby recently and a lot of people, you know, make these comments like, oh, like you're going to bring a kid into the world when like the environment is so shitty and like pandemic and, you know, there's all of the, the world is so, so a terrible place, but like looking at this generation of young people and I, and I, I credit social media a lot for, for this that really like are able to harness and, and join together as a community to like make something happen gives me a lot of hope for society as a whole. That's, so that's yeah, like a it's beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful to have, to have hope. <laughs> Sorry. What was the last part? I was going to say one thing that I said, and we, we talked about this right before we started recording. I wrote down three things on a piece of paper. Uh -huh. So we said it before. We've known each other for a lot of years. And I the reason why I wanted to do this podcast is roughly 17. Exactly. We've always had these like amazing conversations that go kind of in this crazy wild, like touch all of these different things that don't seem connected at all, but like are weirdly connected. And so I wrote down three things and I didn't tell you what they were. And I, guaranteed in my mind that we would hit on those three things and um i even wrote them on this envelope that says secret ballot on it <laughs> so you know that it's like really official and we hit on all three things and those three things were art history the talmud slash hebrew and we yes. talked about both of those things which i'm very impressed by and social media that's uh, amazing so, i had in my notes similarly mm -hmm. Biblical Hebrew, digital strategy, philosophy of art, and then the, I didn't I didn't bring it up, but we kind of talked about it a little bit. Would be like mo motherhood during Corona. It didn't oh, yeah. it? Didn't it? Didn't come up or or fit uh, the moment? But we, we touched it. Yeah, <laughs> we, we 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 ended it on a good note to segue it in terms of of hope, yeah. which is uh, always a good thing. Um, that's a very biblical thing. That's why, you know, in job interviews, they usually ask you for like your strengths first and then your weaknesses second. I, I don't like that. You know, I learned from Tanakh years ago that you, you know, you begin with the curse and then you go to the blessing, you know, begin with the bad stuff, the the despair and then go to the hope. So ending ending on the hope is so great. And the power that that you are talking about that this coming generation has, I, I completely believe in that. It's it's a distributed power. And one of the interesting things from like a political perspective, because that's more, you know, my background and, and how I look at things is like whether you look at dissident right or the dissident left, if, if those terms are, you know, even effective anymore, I, I've seen this commonality. And it's like you are describing how diverse the, the TikTok population are, no matter how diverse they are there are these certain basic things that they just universally critique so that they'll you know band together to expel this like common enemy which is just like the original you know watchmen comic or the ender's game series it's like a thing you see in in literature it's like you might have your bickering or your your differences but when there's something so egregious like you will you will have strange bedfellows, but you'll <laughs> you'll get that thing together. So thank you, thank you so much, and I'm I'm glad we hit all all the things on on the secret ballot. This was great. Thanks, Hanok.